talk concerns a socioeconomic phenomenon that's often called energy poverty. And before I get into any detailed description, I'd actually like to read this quote, which I think embodies a lot of the characteristics of living in a life uh, without electricity. So this is from a woman named Rosa in Kenya. For me, getting energy for cooking and lighting is a daily worry. It's so hard to find firewood that I cook for my family, and only once a day in the evening, the fire provides the light for cooking and eating a meal with my children after eating is bedtime. So in the US and Europe, we tend to take electricity for granted. Um, in fact, the International Energy Association uh, reports that 2.4 billion people in the world live without a reliable source of electricity or without electricity at all. And so in the US and Europe, we think of electricity as some commodity that we purchase. It's what lights our bulbs uh, in our houses, in our homes. Um, but it's more than just that. Access to electricity has so many different positive externalities associated with it, such as opportunities for education, opportunities for income generation, as well as sanitation and healthcare. So um, this is a little bit of a contentious slide, but don't jump out of your seats just yet. Wait till I, I get to the point. Um, so one of the questions is, so why does energy poverty exist? Um, I mean, energy poverty, there, there tends to be a high correlation with lower income countries um, that have uh, significant amounts of energy poverty. And so arguably, you know, these countries got a, a little bit of a later start in terms of development. You know, many of them are new as of the, you know, the past 60 years or so. Um, but also another socioeconomic phenomenon can be used to describe this situation, and that's called the poverty penalty. Poverty penalty explains why certain goods and services in lower income neighborhoods tend to be a little bit more expensive than they are in higher income neighborhoods. So in rural locations in, in low income countries, uh, many instances, electricity provided to them is expensive, more expensive than it would be in higher income neighborhoods or in the city centers. Um, and oftentimes, that electricity doesn't exist within those areas. Um, and if we extrapolate that concept to the US, in fact, um, that serves to explain the same reason why we tend not to see grocery stores in lower income neighborhoods. So anytime, and I'm coming from a policy background, anytime there's a, a, a non-competitive uh, or non-existent market, that's an argument for policy intervention. And in the past, in the US, we've seen this in the case of addressing lack of electricity with the Rural Electrification Administration under FDR. Um, so that provided loans to utility companies um, to extend their transmission networks into areas in which there was no access to electricity. And part of this has to do with um, some level of, of, of game theory, and you have to look at it from the firm's perspective. They see lower income consumers as risk averse consumers. Um, so they see it as a higher opportunity cost to go into those areas. So this is where uh, government intervention is required in order to subsidize or, or lower the risk involved in entering those, those areas, um, incentivizes those, those businesses to go into those areas and provide electricity in this case. Um, and a further argument is that you know, the, the society as a whole benefits from this um, because those firms are unable to catch the downstream benefits of having access to electricity, right? So you know, from they, they, they don't enjoy um, the opportunities for education that are provided um, to those households, but the government, in fact, does. Um, people are more educated and um, additional tax revenue, looking at it from the government's perspective. And actually, in fact, um, Rural Electrification Administration has been used as a um, sort of a, a benchmark um, policy um, in many developing countries. It's been seen as a wild success and has been mimicked many instances. Um, but one of the problems in working in, in many developing countries is, uh, unfortunately, there tends to be a high uh, incidence of corruption. Uh, within those countries, and there's many different arguments uh, explaining why this is the case, but it's, it's a reality nonetheless. So um, one of the ways to circumvent um, bad policy is through social enterprise. And this is where essentially uh, firms are delivering some type of social service. Um, they'll often say that their, their number one benchmark for success is social development. 
Um, they'll say they're, they're double bottom line or triple bottom line. Social development, for profit, and environmental sustainability. And the American Red Cross is actually a very good example of this because in the past, um, the US government tried to uh, regulate the, um, the, the collection and distribution of blood in the US, but it was found that the system was extremely inefficient. And so when the American Red Cross came about, um, discovered that it was much more efficient uh, at collecting and distributing blood than the government was, and so it was officially chartered. So again, this is, is what's called a, a social enterprise. And so I'm starting a social enterprise um, with a couple of students uh, at the Rochester Institute of Technology, um, as well as one um, recent graduate of, from University of Rochester, um, in which we're, we're taking a little bit of a spin on things, and we're using a social enterprise to deliver wind turbines to low-income people in developing countries, um, more specifically emerging market countries like India and China. Um, and our pilot market is currently in Kosovo. And the reason why we chose the name Wind Gardens is thinking about things in a smaller scale. So usually a renewable energy in the US and Western Europe is in the form of solar farms and wind farms, but instead we're scaling this down to a more intimate level. And because of many of the inefficiencies in um, collaborating with, with, with government, um, which is normally what you would have to do in the case of a wind farm or a solar farm, uh, instead we're using the private market um, as a means for distributing these wind turbines and alleviating uh, energy poverty as a consequence. Um, so one question I'm always asked is, where the heck is Kosovo? Um, it's a totally reasonable question, because uh, honestly I didn't know where it was myself until uh, two weeks or so before I, I went my first time, uh, December of last year. And so Kosovo is a former Yugoslavian country. Um, it's just south of Serbia, and it's actually two countries north of Greece. Um, so it goes Greece, Macedonia, then Kosovo. And just to the left of it is Albania and then the Adriatic Sea. Um, the weather there is actually pretty similar to here in New York, except it gets a little bit of a breeze from the Adriatic Sea, which is helpful for us, of course, that breeze. Um, and so I, I attend the Rochester Institute of Technology, which started the American University of Kosovo some 10 years ago. And back in December of last year, I was able to participate in a class in which RIT students went over to the American University of Kosovo um, to collaborate on developing some business for social development within Kosovo. And so uh, we started working on this, this wind turbine business, saw a lot of opportunities, and um, decided to run away with it. So this photo was taken about a week and a half ago. Um, this is my colleague Shpend Yusufi, um, and that is Kosovo A. It's a coal-fired power plant that was built in the 1950s. Um, and Kosovo is actually a very interesting place for renewable energies because they are so addicted to coal. In fact, they sit on the fifth largest coal reserve in Europe. 98% of the country's electricity comes from lignite, which is the dirtiest form of coal that you can, that you can burn. Um, and this city is uh, called Obelich. This is where their two power plants are. And it's considered the dirtiest city in Europe. Um, United Nations Development Program did a report about three years ago and found that 30% of the people living in Obelich were diagnosed with some respiratory disease. Um, so there's quite a lot of problems with having these, um, these, old, uh, these old coal facilities. So our target customer are dairy farmers. Uh, we discovered that um, the dairy industry in Koso has a lot of opportunity for growth. We had spoken to a number of dairy processors so those are people who add value to, um, to raw milk. They either turn it into cheese or yogurt or package the milk. And we discovered that they had a strong demand for their product, but the problem with them is that they weren't getting enough supply. And so where did we go next? We went to the farmers, spoke to them, and discovered that they weren't getting enough electricity. And why do you need electricity for milk production? Through refrigeration. Milk is extremely temperamental, um, needs to be kept at a very stable temperature, and unfortunately, farmers are only getting a limited amount of electricity every day. And so the, the development of their business has been inhibited. And so a way for them to sort of mitigate the effects of this lack of electricity is through the use of diesel generators. But uh, we have to think about this in a context of this is a, a, a country much poorer than the US. Uh, in fact, their, their GDP per capita or their average income in Kosovo is a little over $2,000. Um, so in comparison to the U.S., they have about 1 20th, you know, per household, they have like 1 20th of what we own. And they're spending, and this, this is uh, Shakif Aslani, we spoke to him last week, 
And um, Shakif is spending a little over 150 euros a month on diesel gas. That's an awful lot of money for, for someone like him. Um, so that's a little over 200 US dollars per month um, to operate his business. So a whole lot of money is going to the overhead of his company. And so we see a lot of opportunity um, for the implementation of wind turbines. In fact, we, we, uh, you know, we came upon wind turbines as the most appropriate technological solution for this issue. And so not only are we doing some business development, but also we're designing some technology ourselves. Unfortunately, um, my two engineering colleagues are with me, so please ask them some questions later. And on, on, the, on the left, you'll see a wind turbine blade um, this is a design of one. In fact, we just finished the molds of it. But our goal is to design the least expensive three and five kilowatt turbine models available on the market. Essentially, we're subscribing to a philosophy known as appropriate technology. If anyone's familiar with the, the economist E.F. Schumacher, he promoted this concept of appropriate technology or intermediate technology in which instead of just taking a technology that exists in a higher income country and transferring it to a lower income country, instead use that technology as a model and instead mold it to the socioeconomic conditions uh, as well as uh, some cultural conditions of those, that particular country. Um, so we're taking a spin on things and uh, we are designing our wind turbine to be more labor intensive than it is capital intensive, not only in its assembly, but also in some elements of its manufacturing, including the blades themselves. They don't require any special equipment. So in some sense, we're, we're making better use of the local resources. And additionally, um, what you'll see on the right is a device um, that we're calling a remote data acquisition system. Sort of the fun thing in working in renewable energies um, is that we're able to tap into what are called carbon trading markets. Um, this is currently, uh, we're able to tap into those those uh, groups are individuals who are more concerned about their, um, their carbon output. So oftentimes, um, some government institutions, um, some education institutions and, and uh, companies with some level of corporate social responsibility um, that are concerned about their carbon footprint. And so we are able to sell, essentially, offset carbon emissions, electricity produced uh, from renewable energy sources. And um, this device monitors the power output of the wind turbines. And um, I forgot to mention that one of the issues in working in this space is that auditing turbines is a little bit difficult in developing countries. Because normally, an auditor has to go out um, to some wind installation, which is typically a wind farm, and it's in some developed country, and they monitor the power output after one, year, or one month. Um, but the tricky thing is that we are working in a, a lower income country in which we'd have to fly out an auditor, and we're working in distributed energy, so they would have to go around to many different farms. So this device, it monitors the power output, collects the data, sends it through a cell phone signal to a central server in the capital Pristina in Kosovo, aggregates all of the data from all of the turbines around the country, and then we're able to bundle it and send it to a carbon trader uh, in the UK and then sell those carbon offsets. And so our a um, company called Energy Gardens International in which we enter lower income countries and create markets in which no markets existed before. And our goal is to also democratize the wind turbine, make it at an affordable price. And we see a lot of reciprocity in, in doing this and that it's not only for lower income countries, but we can reapply it to developed countries like the um, General Electric uh, $20 X-ray system that was developed in India. It's been applied in the US now. So, Fali Mindere Shum, which is thank you very much in Albanian, what they speak in Kosovo. And if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to send me an email at adam at kosovowind.com. Thanks very much. Thank you.